jump into, I'm still in the book of James, starting chapter 2 this morning, and amazement upon amazement. Oh, i got to turn this on. Amazement upon amazement, we are looking at nine verses. Not just two, not just three. We're looking at nine verses this morning. James stretched it out a little bit from that chapter one. There was an outline out there on the outer table. If you pick that up, we're going to talk about prejudice, being prejudiced, discrimination, uh, partiality. All three of those words today. But I have a humorous anecdote about three hymns. All right? One Sunday, a pastor told his congregation that the church needed some extra money and asked the people to prayerfully consider giving a little extra in the offering plate. He said that whoever gave the most would be able to pick out three hymns. After the offering plates were passed, the pastor glanced down and noticed somebody had placed a $1,000 bill in the offering. He was so excited that he immediately shared his joy with his congregation and he said he'd like, the person, he'd like to personally thank the person who placed that money in the plate. An unmarried young lady all the way in the back shyly raised her hand. The pastor asked her to come to the front. Slowly, she made her way to the pastor. He told her how wonderful it was that she gave so much and in thanksgiving asked her to pick out three hymns. Her eyes brightened as she looked over the congregation. She pointed to the three most handsome unmarried men in the building and said, I'll take him and him and him. <laughs> she got her three hymns that day. All right, here's our text. We're going to look at James, James chapter 2. We finished chapter 1. We're starting chapter 2. I could have even gone a couple more verses through 11. Uh, but James chapter 1, we will read this together this morning. I'll read it out loud. You follow along. Uh, ESV version here. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing come into your assembly, they were meeting together, a rich man comes into the assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my, bro my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, and he quotes, he quotes Jesus who quoted the Old Testament, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Yeah, so nine verses here talking about showing partiality. So here's my outline this morning. If you picked up one of the sheets out there, first of all, I'm going to talk about verse one. He gives the command. He gives the command. Secondly, he gives them an illustration. Now, this illustration probably actually happened. Probably actually happened a lot of times in the churches. James is talking to believers and he saw some problems in their Christian life. We talked about that. All through chapter 1, he saw another problem, showing partiality. He gives an illustration, verses 2 through 4. Then verse 3, or uh, my third point, he gives a number of reasons. Okay? Verses 5 through 9. 
God has chosen the poor, verse 5. The rich oppress the believers, verse 6. The rich blaspheme the Lord, verse 7. And then partiality breaks the royal law, verses 8 and 9. So we'll work our way through this outline this morning. Okay, point number one, the command. James says, again, my brothers, he's talking to believers. This book was written to believers. He constantly addresses them as his brothers and sisters in the Lord. He says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. We as Christians are not to show partiality. Now, we think partiality and all that. I, I don't know that we do that. I don't understand that. Well, I went to I went to a thesaurus, online thesaurus. You know, nobody has the actual thesaurus sitting on their shelf anymore. Online thesaurus. And I want to look at some synonyms for the term partiality. We don't think partiality is that big of a sin. Well, let's look at some of the synonyms that this thesaurus, thesaurus had. Favoritism. Okay, some of the translations even translates it showing favoritism, partiality. Favoritism. Well, okay, uh, we shouldn't show favoritism, but we think of that, you know, maybe a school teacher has a favorite student over another student. You know, we don't think of this as a big sin. Well, how about showing bias? Oh, well, no, maybe, yeah. How about prejudice? Oh. Maybe using that word puts in our mind that it is a little bit more of a sin than what we think it is. How about giving preferential treatment to some and giving, what should I say, uh, non-preferential treatment to others? And how about this? We even have laws in our country about discrimination. Now, if we think of those synonyms, prejudice, preferential treatment, discrimination, we realize that this is an important topic for us Christians to consider in our lives. Are we prejudiced against certain races, certain um, so those in different social standings? We need to be careful about that. Uh, we see forms of prejudice and discrimination in the New Testament. The Jews were prejudiced against the Gentiles. There are several places in the New Testament where the Jews would call the Gentiles dogs. All those, those dogs, huh? They were prejudiced against them. We're the important race that God has chosen throughout the whole Old Testament. Those Gentiles, they're good for nothing, and we're more important than they are. We see prejudice there. The Jews were prejudiced against the Samaritans. Notice what John says in John chapter 4, verse 9. The disciples and Jesus are going from Judea back up to Galilee. And John mentions in order to do that, they had to go way around and skip Samaria, or they had to go right through Samaria. Well, Jesus stopped and talked to this woman at the well, John chapter 4. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then John adds this, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Huh? You talk about prejudice and bias and preferential treatment. Jesus was breaking with social custom because here was a man who was talking to a lowly woman. They didn't do that in those days and a Jew talking to a Samaritan, so much so that it surprised this woman. The Jews were prejudiced against the Samaritans. The Jews from Judea were even prejudiced against those from Galilee. The Jews, I don't know if you know your Bible map, but there were two regions where the Jews lived, and Samaria was in the middle. There was Galilee up in the north, and there was Judea down in the south, Jerusalem and the temple was down in the south, but many Jews lived up in Galilee, a much larger region. The Jews that lived down in Judea, near Jerusalem, near the temple, 
they were they thought they were much better than the Galileans. We we hear that um, the, the Jews of Judea talked about Jesus' disciples. Oh, they are Galileans, kind of with a prejudice. I quote here, Nathaniel in John chapter 1 says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that goes back to the fact that the Judean Jews felt that the Galilean Jews weren't nearly as, poor, as important as what they were. Isn't it funny the kinds of prejudices we pick up. Most of the time, our prejudices come from pride because we want to feel that we are better than certain other kinds of people. They had strange, we think, strange prejudices. How, can, how, come, how come the Jews of Judea thought they were more important than the Jews of Galilee? What a strange prejudice. But maybe we need to look at our lives do we have the same kind of strange prejudices against different kinds of people? I got some cross references here. Romans chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality by the way that word partiality there is the same one that james uses in our text today james chapter 2 god does not show partiality god loves the world john 3 16 jesus died for the sins of all mankind and god wants people to be saved from every race and nation on the face of the earth, he loves them. This might surprise you. He loves other people as much as he loves you. Yeah, yeah. We don't think he does because we're prejudiced. Huh? Can I say it? White, middle class, wealthier people in the United States, they're more important than those in wherever in the world that's how we often think but god loves them as much here's another one galatians chapter 3 verses 27 and 28 for as many of uh, of you as were baptized into christ have put on christ there is neither in god's new kingdom the church age that we're in there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. That kind of gets at James's illustration that we're going to look at in just a minute. There is male nor and fe there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. God is not prejudiced, and He has opened His kingdom up for everyone, and God wants everyone to come into His kingdom, regardless of race or gender, or social standing. They are all important to God. Colossians 3.11, a very similar verse to the one that we just looked at. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. It's rather interesting the Jews felt they were more important uh, than the Greeks. So Paul mentions, no, both Greeks and Jews are important to God. But then the Greeks, those of civilized Roman Empire, felt they were far more important than those barbarians that lived to the north. Do you realize that barbarians was an actual group of people or a number of groups of people. To us, it has become to mean, you know, somebody who's uncivilized. We call them a barbarian. But that's because those in the Roman Empire felt that they were far more important than those barbarians that lived to the north. Paul makes sure that he says, wait a minute, Barbarians are just as important as the Greeks are to God. Where do we come up with this prejudice against them? But Christ is all and in all. All right, point number two. Now James gives an illustration. I think James had actually seen this take place in 
the local assembly. Believers, uh, right from the beginning, were meant to regularly meet together in local churches. James talks about something that occurred in one of those assemblies. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and right behind him, coming through that door, a poor man in, I don't know why the ESV translates that as shabby clothing, and that, maybe that's pretty good. You look up that word, it literally means dirty, dirty clothing. A guy comes in, he hadn't had a bath for three months. And a rich guy comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good, fine place. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. He says, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Illustration. Rich guy comes in. You know, the pastor's mind immediately goes to, boy, if he'd start coming and he'd start tithing, our income would really go up. We better make friends with him, treat him right, because maybe he'll come back. And then the dirty bum comes in, and nobody wants to sit close to him because he stinks. You know, he hasn't had a bath in months. Maybe he's got lice in his hair. Who knows? And, and uh, certainly, he isn't as important in God's eyes as this rich, wealthy guy is. That's what goes into our minds and our thoughts. And God says, no, that is showing, James says, that is showing prejudice. That is showing discrimination. Sit down at my feet. You saw that on that, on that one verse that they said to the, said to the poor person. It's kind of interesting. I was looking at researching some of the Greek words here. Uh, sometimes that that word, sit down at my feet, is actually translated sit down at the, my footstool. But it, it got a kind of, I, I don't know that James meant it this way, but the word James uses here is used of a victorious general. He would have the losing commander of the enemy lay down in front of him and he would put his foot on his neck as a symbol of victory over him. You were saying, you guys are now my footstool. I have defeated you. That's how this Greek word was used. Now, did James mean it that way? Perhaps he didn't have that necessarily in mind, but James did mean for the poor to sit at the feet of others indicates that they were inferior and not as important as this wealthy guy who come in with the ring and the fine clothing. James' illustration indicates that they were being prejudiced. I wonder, do we care for those out there who are of a lower class than maybe we are? Would we give preferential treatment to others who, who are kind of upper class? I got to read this. Uh, uh, supposedly this is true because I checked it out in, other, in uh, other sources. When he was a student, the famous Indian leader, Mahatma Gandhi, you've heard of him, he was a Buddhist uh, in India, he considered becoming a Christian. He read the Gospels and was moved by them. It seemed to him that Christianity offered a solution to the caste system that plagued the people of India. One Sunday, he went to a local church. He had decided to see the pastor and ask for instructions on the way of salvation. But when he entered the church, which, con which consisted of white people, the ushers refused to give him a seat. They told him to go and worship with his own people. He left and never went back. He said, if Christians have caste differences also, I might as well remain a, what did I say, Buddhist? A Hindu. He was a Hindu. Isn't that interesting? Because they were showing prejudice, they were driving people away from Jesus Christ. We need to be careful about how we treat all people. 
James starts giving some reasons now, verses 5 through 9. I think I had four of them listed there. Number one, James says, God has chosen the poor. Believe, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? What was James seeing here? Well, Christianity, the early church, as it spread through the Roman Empire, was mostly, mostly accepted by the lowly, by the slaves, by the poor. They were going through much trouble in life, and they heard the gospel, and they realized that Jesus had died for them. And by far, the majority of the people that came to the Lord were lower class people in the Roman Empire. James is referring that here. And yet, we... James is saying, we treat the lowly as if they are less important. They're the people that are coming into the kingdom of God. A couple of cross-references with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Paul said the same thing as James. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many powerful and powerful conditions not many were of noble birth but god chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise god chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong it was the lowly people not of noble birth not considered very educated and wise these were the people that were coming to jesus christ taking him as their savior Second reason, the rich oppress believers. He's, James says, why? Th this rich guy comes in, and you guys treat him as being really something, and yet it is, it is, it is the rich that oppress you. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you to court? William Barclay, <laughs> William Barclay is an interesting commentary. He's got these everyday commentaries and um, very interesting to read. William Barclay was an agnostic. While well, he held to universal salvation, that everyone would go to heaven, um, he didn't believe that people were sinners. Uh, he, he really wasn't, well, I don't know that we would consider him an evangelical born-again Christian. Yet, as you read his commentaries, he had a lot of interesting insights in the scripture text that he, that he expounds on. Here's one, one thing he says here. If a creditor met, he had researched the background here, if a creditor met a debtor on the street, he could seize him by the neck of his robe, nearly throttling him and literally drag him to the law courts. And the rich would often do that. The poor would become indebted to them, because they couldn't get along, and then the rich man loaned money to them, and then the rich man wants it back, and they don't have it. So the rich man would mistreat them, often bringing them to court. Many times it was the slaves that were the believers going to church regularly, and now the slave owner had problems because these slaves, they were going off to church, and they were changing from what they used to be. That's where it's from. The prophets often confront Israel for opposing the poor. Uh, going back to last week's message about the orphans and widows, especially orphans and widows. And I got a whole bunch of texts here. I didn't put them on the screen, but the prophets often rebuked uh, the rich because they were oppressing the poor. It was a sin that went on in Israel. Sodom. Now, Sodom had been long gone when Ezekiel wrote, but Ezekiel tells us why one of the reasons Sodom was condemned. Sodom was condemned because, and this is a quote from Ezekiel 1649, had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. The people of Sodom, one of the reasons they were destroyed is because the rich and the wealthy cared nothing for the poor. In the New Testament, Paul exhorts, Colossians 4.1, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, 
knowing that you too have a master in heaven. James says, why do you give preferential treatment to the rich man who has come into your midst when they are the people who oppress you? The rich blaspheme the Lord. Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? The rich, they blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ. And yet, when they come into your assembly, you give them preferential treatment over the poor by which you were called. That's an interesting phrase. Literally rendered, which has been called upon you. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Um, It refers to the practice of a wife taking her husband's name or children, especially adopted children, taking on the name of of his father. I'm going to put Eugene on the spot here. Eugene, what's your last name? What's that? Her last name. Eugene Herrick. Yeah. Eugene didn't used to be Eugene Herrick until we adopted him, and he has taken on the name Herrick. Changed right on his birth certificate when we adopted him. James says, that precious, na- the, the rich, I'm going to go back there, the rich blaspheme the honorable name by which we have been called. Remember the book of Acts? Kind of, it's given in derision originally, but it is given in pride to the, to the, to the believer. And the book of Acts says they were called Christians first at Antioch. We have taken on the name of Jesus Christ, being called Christians. And yet they are rich, and those who we give preferential treatment to, they blaspheme that honorable name of Jesus Christ. William Barclay, again, he's got another one here. He says uh, that the wealthy slave owners, now most of those who were probably in that local church that James is talking about were slaves, And the rich guy that came in was probably a slave owner. You know, James has given us this illustration, but when it happened in real life, that's probably what he was. That wealthy slave owner may have insulted their Christian slaves or the slave's new lord and master because of several reasons. Some of the slaves were getting saved. Um, The believing slave would have a new sense of independence and thus no longer cringe at his master's power. Why? Because he got saved now. He's got to change life. He would have a new sense of honesty and thus not go along with the master's dishonest practices anymore. You know, you can just see this slave comes to his master and he says, you know, I've, I found Jesus Christ as my savior and I can't, I just can't, I'm sorry, master, but I can't do that dishonest practice that you've asked me to do any longer. Ah, the unsaved master, what do you think he would think, you know? Uh, He would have a new sense of priorities and thus insist on leaving work aside so that he could worship with his fellow believers. Uh, Master, master, I wonder if I can have Sunday morning off so that I can go meet together in an assembly with the other believers. What? Who's going to fix me my Sunday morning coffee when I finally roll out of bed at 11.30 or 12 o'clock noon, you know? So the master is, who is this Jesus Christ that my slaves are now being loyal to? And they, it, that was making these rich, wealthy slave owners angry because the slaves were different than what they used to be. So they were blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ. And then the last reason. How am I doing on time? Oh, very good. Partiality breaks the law, the royal law. The royal law... James says this, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, and James tells us what he's referring to here as the royal law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. He says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, how about your neighbor? Maybe your neighbor's kind of a wealthy person, doesn't have much to do with you because he's more important than you are. But maybe your neighbor is a lowly, poor person. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
James calls that the royal law. Where does that come from? Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40. Teacher, somebody came to Jesus and asked Jesus this. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? The Old Testament has a whole bunch of commands for us, but Jesus, which is the most important? Well, Jesus had an answer for that. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He quotes from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, if I remember right there. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that became known as the royal law. James quotes that here. The second of the great commandments. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. Treating them properly without prejudice. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Well, conclusion. I wonder if we seriously looked at our lives. I wonder if we have prejudice in our lives. James rebuked the believers of the early church for their prejudice. We need to be careful about that. We need to love people, all people. We need to treat them respectfully, honestly, fairly, not giving preferential treatment to one group over the other because God loves all of them and wants them to be saved and come into his kingdom. I've said this, James focuses on prejudice against the poor, favoring the rich. That was just one kind of prejudice. But we can have other forms of prejudice based on race or whatever other reasons we may have for prejudice. God has sent the gospel to all. Jesus died on the cross for all people. We need to stop our prejudices, treating all with respect and love. Do I get another point after that? If I don't, it's going to go to your song, and the song's going to start playing, and we aren't ready for it. Do I dare? I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our lives and would show us if we have prejudice, Lord. Father, may we love people, all people, no matter how lowly they may seem to us. May we love them. May we share the gospel with them. May we as a local church reach out to them, Father, and see people come to know you. Bless your word to our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we can have that.